Hello and welcome to Bud's RPG Review, where I give my thoughts on role-playing games, card games and board games. To celebrate my channel passing the 400 subscriber mark, I've decided to pull one from the vault. 1993's I Was the Evil for AD&D 2nd Edition by TSR. Ok, first a bit of history. I Was the Evil is a 96 page softback accessory that discusses the Empire priests and magic that I Was the Old controls after the Greyhawk Wars. It was written by Greyhawk guru Carl Sargent and was one of the last publications released for the world of Greyhawk setting. As a footnote here, I'd like to discuss the name, I Was. I've done a bit of digging around the internet to see how it's pronounced by other people and I've come across various iterations. I Us, I Us, Yuz, all seem to be popular. I, however, have been pronouncing it I Us for as long as I can remember, so that's what I'm going to stick with. Your Greyhawk may vary. Ok, to the cover. Here we have a depiction of what I assume is I was in his old man form by Jeff Easley. It's not a bad piece, but it doesn't really tell a story for me. Ok, to the inside. We have a map of the world of Greyhawk as it stands post-war, done in the same style as the original world of Greyhawk box set. First up is chapter 1, Empire of Terror. This chapter gives a resume of the history of the lands of Ayos, and an overview of how it roughly stands. First up it gives the history of Ayos himself. Ayos was the child of the great human necromancer Igwilv and the demon lord Grazit, and was born a Cambian. His empire began with growing up as the son of a minor despot and him taking control of a few hundred chaotic bandits. As time passed, Ayers' warband grew, with the Kelbit and Jebli orcs of the Vesvi joining his ranks. Aided by his incredibly powerful mother, Ayers took control of what would become the land of Ayers in little over ten years. He formed the capital city, Daraka, described as a charnel house with a road of skulls that lead to it. In around 505 Common Year, or CY, Ayers was somehow banished in the dungeons of Castle Greyhawk. His mother offended Grazit and was imprisoned on the abyss. In his absence, demons fought for power and the good folk breathed a temporary sigh of relief. A strange alliance freed him in 570 CY and he had somehow, during his banishment, risen to the power of a demigod with the prime material plane as his home. Upon his release, Ayos was filled with the desire for vengeance and conquest as his long banishment had given him a focus he had previously lacked. He formed two inner circles of spellcasters, the greater and lesser Boneheart, with six in each level, and his agents began scouring the Flaness, seeking arcane evils and relics, as he gathered his power and he readied for war. He discovered that the Temple of Elemental Evil that he had developed with Zugtamoy had been sacked, but unknown to Zugtamoy, it was a clever ruse designed to draw powerful monsters and cause the forces of good in Verbabong, Fiondi and Valuna to rise against it, and it worked, as Zugtamoy was bound inside it, unable to play her dangerous game with Ayos anymore. His first act was to construct a fiction of the great god Vaton. He used this to ally the barbarian nations together, drawing them to the hold of Stonefist and subjugating them. In turn, the fists under the charmed leader, Sevor Redbeard, swept into ten and conquered it with ease. This drew the attention of the powerful nations of the Flaness. The Vaton ruse didn't last long, as the barbarians were ordered to attack a long-time ally, Ratlik, and the barbarians began abandoning Ios. In the week of the Blood Moon, 582 CY, the hierarchs of the Horn Society were vanquished in a matter of days by demons working for Ayos, and the nation's hobgoblin soldiers were absorbed into Ayos' forces. Fearing that beyond these warnings of Ayos' rise were a ruse, the Knights of the Holy Shielding hesitated in accepting an army on their soil and were promptly invaded by Ayos' forces. At this point, the war had awakened some of the slumbering nations of the Flaness. The war, fought on many fronts, culminated in Ayos' army being driven back north in the autumn of 584 CY and the signing of the Pact of Greyhawk to end the war. As of the current year, Ayos controls the Horn Society and the Shieldlands, although he faces resistance in the Bandit Kingdoms, the Felri Forest and the Vesvi Forest. In 10, Ayos has influence but no control, but his biggest issue is that of resource, with some lands being agriculturally poor but needing to feed Ayos' humanoid armies, and the absolute paranoia that fills Ayos' priesthood with everyone trying to backstab everyone else to assume control. This goes right to the top, with Ayers himself being paranoid about the loyalty of his priests and servitors. This is not helped by Ayers' whimsical, self-destructive manner. Ayers also bears a huge, obsessive grudge with those who imprisoned him underneath Castle Greyhawk. The Mad Archmage Zagig, Heward, Merland, Keogtum, Kellen and the Prince of Swords, and the gods St Cuthbert. Although with the six of them being so powerful, a deity, a demigod and four quasi-deities, he would have an extremely hard time defeating them. Instead, Ayers saw vengeance on those who freed him and then tried to slay him. Lord Robilar, the Orc, Quidge the Patriarch of Bokob, Rigby, the Archmages Tensa and Bigby, and the fighter, Neb Retnar. Ayers was nearly destroyed and fled to the Abyss, and since that time has protected himself with a soul gem secreted in some well-guarded plane of the Abyss. He can be killed on the Prime Material Plane, but unless his soul gem is also destroyed, he will return. Since that time, Tensa has been killed, Robillard is over a thousand miles away and cloaked in anti-scrying magic, as is Quidge. Rigby, now very old, hides in various places, as does Bigby, and Retina is said to have become a cultist of Tharazdan, who Ayos hates and fears. 
Ayers has spies and informants all over the Flaness who inform him of the whereabouts of these. He waits in anticipation for his moment to strike. He currently has an ambassador in the city of Greyhawk, Pyremial Alexany, whom all diplomacy is conducted through. He is apprehensive of the Scarlet Brotherhood, who he fears may be attempting to free Tharazdan. Ayos has risen so swiftly to power in part due to the fact that none of the powers of our earth have struck against him, mostly due to the fact that the prime material plane is his home plane, which the gods are forbidden to interfere directly in, directly being the key word here. The gods of our earth empower their servants to oppose Ayos as best they can. However, there is one exception to this non-intervention rule, St Cuthbert. He was involved in imprisoning Ayers in 505 CY and can only have done so with the agreement of all the gods, evil included. As such, St Cuthbert is Ayers' greatest enemy, while he also shares a hatred for Neril and above all fears Tharazdan, and maybe surprisingly has a tenuous relation with Lolth. The second chapter details the priesthood of Ayers. Ayers' priesthood rules through fear. It embodies the very worst personality traits, behaviours and attracts the worst, foulest people to his worship who revel in murder, pain and suffering. At the top of the pyramid is Ayers himself, with his two high priestesses Althea and Halga being the next in command, with a chronic state of fear being prevalent. We have the expanded spell list that includes the new spells in Tome of Magic, and this is followed by spells that are unique to Ayers' priesthood, including Turnbane, which makes undead harder to turn by good priests, Lifebane, which draws the vitality from living creatures to energise the priest, Chain Madness, which spreads insanity amongst groups of creatures, and Death Touch, which has the power to slay another living creature and transfer the life energy in the process. We then have some magic items associated with the priesthood. Here we have the black staff, which only high-level priests possess, the bone wand, and the ebon skull, of which the creation process has been forgotten and only three are known to exist. Following this is the land of Ayers. It discusses the various folks and factions of the land. Of interest here are the fiends of the land. Ayers has made pacts with various Tenari lords to have a demonic presence in his land, and they can be found in all shapes and sizes, from the mightiest Balor to the lowliest Dretch. It talks about Ayers' relationship with these Tenari lords, as well as his relationship with the Drow and Lolth. We have information on the humanoids of the land, with orcs being the most plentiful. There are various orc tribes that swear loyalty to the Old One, and these are detailed. It then goes into detail on the various places in the land of Ayers. I need to say at this point that if I went into detail around every location in the land of Ayers, we'd be here all day, as the pages are jam-packed, so I will simply outline the notable places of interest. The Howling Hills is first up. Ayos has three citadels here, Kendragund, Krangord and Erzengard. These are well stocked and fortified. Also of note is the Soul Husk Caverns. Here, hidden behind many traps, creatures and great magical defences, is said to be the answer to the mystery as to how Ayos ascended to demigod status. Next of note is the capital city, Daraka, City of Skulls. We have a basic map of the city and a description. Daraka is a place so bad it is said that the word evil doesn't do it justice. Continually overcast in black clouds with demons patrolling its 50 foot high stone walls, it's as close to hell on earth as can be. It details the walks and the city quarters. Of note are the Road of Skulls which is every bit as bad as it sounds. The Boneheart Citadel where the Greater Boneheart dwell and the Agony Fields which is a site of public entertainment for Ayos' deranged followers where one can see torture and murder daily. For more information on Daraka, see the Adventure City of Skulls. Next up is the Northern Vesvi. This area is considered of major importance as it is Ayers' goal to decimate it and he has stationed one of his lesser Boneheart priests, Panjazek, here. The Central Vesvi is the domain of the Orc Selba tribe in Grenxarund. Also within the Vesvi is Waterwall, a unique subterranean base for Ayers' forces hidden by hallucinatory terrain. Following this is the Fiondian Borderlands. These lands are awash with armies and part of it is a no man's land. Here we have the Bone Road and the Raising Line. Bone Road is similar in construction to the Road of Skulls, only slightly more careless, and the Raising Line is a quarter of a mile wide area of blasted barren land. It has been decimated by priests of Ayos with fire and acid in order to prepare it in some way for animate dead spells, and is of some concern to the Fiondians. Then we have the Horned Lands. These are ruled from the capital, Molag, by High Priestess Althea, although the effective ruler is a lesser Boneheart priest called Marinac. Ayos' priests keep watchful eyes over the Horned Lands. It's ruled through Ayos' usual method of bullying and terror. In the Horned Lands, demons in the service of Lord Pazriel, but under Ayos' command, have great influence. Of note here is the magical gem, Dwernite, a special type of gem that can only be found here that contains random spells with both wish and longevity magic having been discovered. We have a rough map of Molag with some information on the city. Of note here is a place called Pinnacle. Pinnacle is a huge standing stone, some 150 foot high, that contains a magically concealed secret door on its base. If you enter, it leads down some stairs to a series of bizarre multicoloured catacombs filled with drifting mists. If one searches the caverns enough, a cache of Dwernite gems can be found. Next up is the Shieldlands. These fell swiftly during the wars. The capital city of Admundford is held by Ayos and ruled over by the lesser Boneheart mage Vane and a mix of orcs and orogs. 
of note here is the walled town of Critwall. Although the town is currently occupied, a group of some 40 or so street children have managed to stay alive in the rubbled ruins and regularly steal food from the humanoid troops who can't seem to be able to capture them. They have amassed a selection of powerful magical items and avoid dying of injuries or disease due to a magical fountain underneath the ruined temple of Pelor. Also of note here is Ringland. This is a small 60 mile estate that has a powerful antipathy spell cast on it by some long dead mage that repels creatures of evil alignment. There's a settlement of humans within the area that continue to farm the land and survive undisturbed. Following this is the bandit lands. These lands are in a constant flux with petty conflict between priests of Ayos. It's currently overlooked by a lesser boneheart wizard called Kranza. Of note here is the Rift Canyon and the Barrens. The Rift Canyon is a nearly 200 mile long fissure that is over a mile deep. It's the home of nearly 6,000 bandits under the faithful service of the self-proclaimed Plar of the Rift, Duran Grossman. There are said to be magical secrets deep within the Rift. Also of note is the grim citadel of Flight Shriver. Of fiendish design and construction, Boneheart members visit here to research new spells and magical effects. Also contained within the citadel is a gateway to the abyss. The Felreeve Forest is next. One of the biggest woodlands in the Flaness is very important to Ayos as it contains the High Folk and forces of Fiondi who he wishes to crush. It's also the location of the mysterious Lake Aqual, a mysterious magical place swarming with huge monsters, and lastly the great necropolis of Nettles Bane, a potential source of 20,000 undead. Within the Felry there is a unique alliance, that of the bandit chief Scanner Hendricks and the Wood Elves. A friendly truce is developed between them and they actively aid each other, teaching each other skills. The forest also has a group of feral druids, who, wearing little more than rags, seem completely otherworldly. Ayos has a poorly organised operation within the forest known as the Marauders, and they're generally war bands of orcs, hobgoblins and orogs. Of note here is Darkpool, a ruined subterranean orcish city currently the hiding place of Hierarch Nesmogen. He's currently on a mission to find the necropolis said to be found within the forest. We also have Dora Kar, a ramshackle village occupied by the insane mage Zemyatin. He slew and animated the entire populace, and now believes himself to be the one true priest of Ayos left on our earth. He is allied with a group of 20 quicklings who he has made invisible. Lastly, we have descriptions of Lake Aqual and Nerol's Bane. Following this is the Northern Barrens. The rovers of the Barrens are a hardy people that still survive here, but are few in numbers with little hope left to sustain them. Of note here is the Gibbering Gate. This hellish fortress is ruled by the illusionist Jumper, and the effect of Ayo's evil can be seen here. A great balor rules over the court of Delirium, where he bellows his judgment over the gibbering demented babble of the lunatics and wretched that live here. The screams and moans can be heard for miles around and it's a truly harrowing place. It also serves as Ayos' prison for particularly important prisoners. It's truly a place to be feared. The Northern Barrens is also the home of the Cold Marshes, which can produce particularly deadly magical winds known as Black Frost and Hoar Wind. Ayos' priests have a particular interest in the Cold Marshes due to this, as it's something they want to be able to reproduce. Next is the Land of Ten. The Teners were a people completely unprepared for war and were defeated by the numerically smaller Stone Fist Force. Ten is occupied by some 20,000 Stonefist men who stay here as slave drivers abusing the population. Ayers' influence is deeply felt within Ten due to the leader of the Stonefist men being under a very powerful charm. Of note in Ten are the Trollfens, a forbidding land filled with great trolls, ogres and gnolls. None of Ayers' forces will enter this dangerous place. Not even the demons will enter here. The following chapter deals with adventure in the Empire. I talk about the adventure themes of running a campaign in the post-war lands, as well as some ideas for low-level gaming. After that is the Armies of Ayers, which gives information to Ayers' forces, and the final chapter is Villains and Heroes. Of note here are the High Priestess Althea of the Greater Boneheart, High Priestess Halga, Archmage Null, Jumper, and the terrifying Kermin Mindbender, replete with his magical turban that allows him to project a mind blast like an illithid. After this are the stats for the Lesser Boneheart and the Bone Shadow, a group of six priests and agents who are active for Ayers. Also included are the stats for Grazit, a Clavdra, the Drow Ambassador and Draka, and the Abyssal Lord Pazril. Also of note is Sindol, commander of the Legion of Black Death, and a Baron Cambion who has served Ayos with utter loyalty for nearly 20 years. For me, Ayos the Evil embodies the very best and worst of the end of AD&D 2nd Edition. The book is absolute wall-to-wall text. Indeed, maps aside, there are only 6 illustrations in the entire 96 pages, which to me shows that TSR knew that Carl Sargent's material was top-notch, but just wanted to get it out there, rather than giving a book on someone as important as Ayos room to breathe. It maybe should have been a larger hardback book, or even a box set with a book similar to this, along with one dedicated solely to Duraka, a selection of detailed maps, and maybe the City of Skulls adventure included. I know I would have bought it. It is important to note the critical role that Ayos plays in the world of Greyhawk setting. 
He's the main villain, or at minimum plays a part, in almost every bad thing that happens there, and this book was a long time coming, but when it did, it was definitely worth the wait. What is here was clearly a labour of love, and the detail really captures the mood and spirit of the setting. The spells and magic items were great additions, and the post-war descriptions of the lands is done in a very dark, evocative fashion. I would have liked to have fully described the lands here, but the review would have been literally hours long, such as the density of material present. The descriptions provided for the characters of the greater and lesser Boneheart are fantastic, and provide enemies that players can aspire to take down, although a mark against it is not including the stats of Igwolf and Ayos himself. If you're a fan of the World of Greyhook setting, and especially Carl Sargent's other work, From the Ashes, you will love Ayos the Evil. It's sad in a way that this wasn't given the treatment that the writing deserved, but in actuality it could have went the way of the unpublished Ivid the Undying, such as the state of TSR's affairs back then. You can get hold of a copy, Ayos the Evil is a fantastic, if dense, read. It's available fairly cheaply as a PDF, I've linked it below. It's my hope that one day Wizards of the Coast will resurrect the world of Greyhawk setting and unleash the old one on a new generation of unsuspecting players. I give Ayers the Evil a solid 8.5 out of 10. If you enjoyed this review, please hit the thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Also, don't forget to check out my other reviews. But out.